Okay, I'm bringing a spotted salamander egg mass to the surface. I'm going to take it out of the water. Um, I will find a way to attach it again. But again, we ask you guys, don't remove egg masses from the sticks that they're on because um, you potentially... See if I can do this without falling in. That's a big one. That's a big one. <laughs> That's a big whopper, Dr. Payton. So this, this is one, one, just to clarify for everybody, this is coronavirus video number two. And notice that we're keeping our safe spacing of six feet that's right. or two meters. <laughs> that's right. And the whole way walking out here, we walked more than six feet apart right. as we talked. So we're being careful. Yep. You guys should be careful. Okay, so this is a spotted salamander egg mass, um, scientific name, Ambistum maculatum. And Dr. Payton, what's the scientific name for the wood frog? Well, I used to remember them as Ranus sylvaticus, but now it's Lithobates sylvatica. Close. Did I get it wrong? Did I get it backwards? It's Lithobates sylvaticus? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. With a Bates with an S, Sylvaticus with an S. Yeah. So when it was Rana, it was Sylvatica. Ka, yep. Ending in A's. Yep. Thank Correct. you. You got an A minus. An A minus. Okay. So Close. This is pretty good for an ornithologist. Yeah. Okay. So this is Ambistum maculatum egg mass. Um, and again, this wasn't floating at the surface like those wood frog egg masses were. This was about. Um, one foot or so, 25 centimeters or so below the surface of the water. And it was attached to a stick, just as the wood frog egg masses are, down below. Now, Dr. Payton, why do you think that the wood frogs lay their eggs near the surface, but the spotted salamanders lay their eggs lower down in the water column? Well, the as you mentioned earlier on, the wood frogs, the closer to the surface, it's warmer, so they're going to hatch at a quicker rate. Um, but I'm not certain why. I'm not certain why Ambistema are always below the surface. Well, it's not an easy question, that's for sure. Um, and we, of course, we never know the the answer for sure. But what we believe is that. Wood frogs have a much shorter developmental period, um, their embryos, than spotted salamanders. So wood frogs, theoretically, those embryos could develop and they could hatch and they could be free swimming tadpoles at about three weeks if it gets warm enough. Spotted salamanders take two months, sometimes longer, to develop their embryos to turn into larvae where they're free swimming. And so if they attach their eggs close to the surface, like the wood frogs do, the pond, as it gets warmer, is drying down, and it could leave them high and dry and exposed. And so that's probably why they lay their eggs deeper, because that pond is going to dry down, and they've got to make sure not to become high and dry over that time period. So that's probably what's going on. With spotted salamanders right now, if we had a high-powered light and waders, we might be able to see some spotted salamander egg masses even two feet, three feet below the surface because it takes them longer to develop. Um, Do a quick question, Dr. Carricker. Do, sure. do spotted salamanders oviposit their egg masses in aggregations like wood frogs do? They do. They don't um, do it to the same extent that wood frogs do. Sometimes with wood frogs, you can find a thousand, three thousand egg masses all in one area. Spotted salamanders tend to um, have their egg masses more broadly distributed, but you'll still find them in the same sides of the wetlands where you get the most afternoon sunlight and the most warmth. And that, in this case, is on the northwest. northwest but it does side. tend to be. Uh, at least in, uh, in spotted salamanders, very often you find individual egg masses and then some places where there's communal aggregations. That's right. There tends to be a lot more spatial segregation in the deposits. De that's right. That's right? right. Very good, Dr. Payton. And also, at least I've noticed in smaller ponds, very often wood frog egg masses can be 
there's not necessarily one communal aggregation that they can be scattered across the pond, whereas in larger ponds, um, they tend to be more aggregated. That's right. In this pond itself, which you and I have both visited often, there tends to be a big aggregation in this area and then over on the other side, far other side of the pond, but still same, same uh, direction facing of that side of the pond. Um, and, and spotted salamander egg masses will be more scattered around. So the difference in structure, these can be, um, it can be challenging to, to identify uh, or differentiate a wood frog versus a spotted salamander egg mass when you first look. After you have some practice, it becomes very easy. But the thing to remember is this, the wood frog egg mass is like a cluster of grapes. There's an individual black embryo and it's surrounded by a membrane and in between the embryo and the membrane is a bunch of jelly. And so it's like a cluster of grapes all together where you can see the individual eggs. The spotted salamander egg mass, in contrast, it has an embryo, a black embryo, with a e membrane around it and jelly in between. And then surrounding the entire thing is a bunch more jelly. So there are a couple eggs out on the outer edge, but most of the eggs are embedded within this broader jelly layer. And that's how you tell the difference. Often a, um, a spotted salamander egg mass looks like um, it's kind of corn dog shaped or like a corn dog that's been run over as you can see here. <laughs> and with wood frogs, it really looks like a cluster of grapes. And that's an easy way to think about it. So one other thing I wanna say about spotted salamander egg masses that's really important is that what you see here is known as the clear form or the opaque form. And the spotted salamander egg masses come in two color morphs, this clear or opaque form and a white form. And where the whole egg mass looks white and you can hardly uh, count the embryos within. Kind of cloudy, milky. Cloudy, milky. Yeah. That's good. Like you've uh, poured some you've got a, a glass with a little bit of water in it and you've poured some milk in there. Yeah. Um, this is the clear form and um, it's the, we don't really understand what the difference or why um, some ponds have a lot of milky form and some don't. I'm actually doing a study right now with a bunch of other researchers trying to understand why there are different frequencies of that milky color morph in different places. What I've learned from my own work is that in the Adirondacks, I looked at thousands of spotted salamander egg masses over five years, and in five years found one milky morph in vernal pools in the Adirondacks. Here, what would you say, Dr. Payton? How, what percent? Uh, you know, I, that's a great question. It varies so much from pond to pond. I can't remember what the percentages ended up being. I would say it's somewhere between 10 to 25 yeah. is what I see. That sounds about that right, sound yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. And then if we go to West Virginia, we were supposed to go to West Virginia for a field trip. It's been canceled now. We were going to do surveys down there, but what I see in West Virginia, it's about 75% of this white milky morph huh. in West Virginia. And we think the relationship is the further south you go, the more white morphs you get. Um, the only thing we know about the white milky morph is that that white coloration is due to a protein but we don't understand its importance and we hope to learn that in the next so do you think so. it's more driven by environmental factors than like for example was driven by predation for example by caddis flies that uh, that doesn't seem very likely doesn't seem very likely but why wasn't it likely if it was predation Be well because I, can't I would think that if it was predation, if, if let's say, for example, um, opaque, the, the milky ones had a lower predation rate, then over evolutionary time, the opaque ones, the, the, the cloudy ones would become much more adaptive, and so the, everything would become cloudy. That's right. So it has to be, it can't be that kind of environment, uh, uh, biotic factor that's driving color. It's got to be some... I don't know what the environmental factor that's driving it, but that's my guess. I think you're absolutely right, because in the Adirondacks, in the vernal pools, there are lots of caddisfly larvae, so that yeah. hypothesis wouldn't make sense yeah. for predation right. or for uh, red-spotted newts, for right. example. Right, right. Um, 
some of our preliminary work with some samples we collected over the last couple of years, there seems to be a relationship between frequency of color morph and levels of dissolved organic carbon in the system. Mm. And I am no chemist and I have no idea what that means, but that's one <laughs> of the factors we're looking at. We're also looking at uh, temperature, UV radiation, things that might um, influence changes in color morphs. We've learned with red back salamanders in previous work that I've done that um, when you've got the red back morph and you've got the lead back morph, there is an absolute relationship between temperature, environmental temperature in an area and the frequency of the lead back morph. Lead backs are more tolerant of warmer temperatures and drier conditions. So in warmer, drier conditions, you get more of that lead back morph. And who knows what we'll find with the morphs in these. Um, so Dr. Payton, thank you for um, all of your great responses to my questions and your insights and i'm going to set this guy free thank you very much time. for an excellent explanation of the breeding ecology of embistema and lithobates thank you dr payton <laughs>